and look at verses 6 through 9 tonight. And what we're looking at is an Abraham-like faith. And we've been talking about faith as we go throughout the book of Galatians the last few weeks. And when I study the book of Galatians, what I have learned is really how um, exact the gospel message is. Um, it is not something that there's a lot of gray area. There's no gray area. It's black and white. There is the gospel and then there's not the gospel. And I actually had a phone call late the other night from a, another pastor, and we got into the same conversation about this. And you know, he asked me, he said, you know, we talked about basically why so many people don't finish the race. And the comment I made was, with so many false gospels being preached today, we really should not be that surprised when we are literally being surrounded with false converts everywhere. Because while they may you know, per portray themselves as Christian, if their idea of what makes them saved is not true, then they you have to question whether they can be truly saved. Um, if their idea is, okay, I'm saved by baptism, saved by communion, saved by uh, uh, walking to the front of a church or whatever, and all these works that they equate to salvation, maybe the fact that they're not really saved should not come as a shocker to anybody. Because they don't understand that salvation is not what you do, but what Christ did. And if your faith is in, okay, I've done all these things, and that's where my faith is, because I've, I've done all these things to earn some great favor with God, then yeah, that's going to fall apart. Because their work cannot make up for all their sin. And that's what we're seeing time and time again. So look at Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 through 9. And the Bible says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Now, there's three important points I want to bring out of this tonight. And the first one we're looking at, and remember, this is Paul referencing back to the covenant of Abraham, and that it is not a covenant of works. Uh, a lot of times we look at the Old Testament, and because we know the Old Testament focuses on the law a lot, we make everything be of works, but it's not. It was still a covenant of faith. But the first thing we want to see is Abraham was declared righteous because he believed God. Now, if we really want to look at the Greek translation of that, that word believed is not how we picture it. It's a thought process. That word believed is a trust thing. If I believe you will catch me when I fall, yes, I know it, but I am trusting in you to catch me as I go down that I won't get hurt. Well, when Abraham believed God, it was not just, hey, I know God, I understand God, I believe he's real, but he trusted God for what he was going to receive. Matthew 12, 5, 20 says, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So, when we see Matthew, we see what the requirement to enter heaven is. Your righteousness, in other words, your per perfection has to be greater than what the Pharisees was and the scribes was. Now, looking at the Pharisees, the Pharisees were these, this group of individuals that was very much law keepers. And they loved the law so much, they made new laws. They didn't just stick with the law of Moses. They created all kinds of laws after the fact. And they said, everyone's got to keep these laws to please God. Now, even with that, they weren't good enough to go to heaven. They weren't perfect enough to earn some great favor or forgiveness from God, which means if you're going to do that by works, your works has got to be greater than these strict law keepers that we see as an example in the, in the Old Testament. Not only that, but Romans 10, 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So, we have the problem in Matthew. The problem in Matthew is our righteousness has to be greater than the Pharisees and the scribes, which... I don't know about you, but I can say for me myself, that is definitely not true. Uh, I strive. I try to do my best. I want to please God with my actions. But yet I'm like Paul. I find myself failing every single day in some way to ever get close enough to where I need to be. I strive every day to do better, but yet every day I still find failure in myself spiritually, physically, and in every way possible when it comes to the ways of God. Yet, because of that, in myself, I cannot have a covenant relationship with God. 
because my righteousness is not good enough. But Romans 10, 4, God gives us a solution to that problem. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now, what we all need is a dose of righteousness. There's a problem. We can't get it. We don't have it. Uh, you hear people talk about Christians and they say they are self-righteous. And sadly, we do have self-righteous Christians in the world. And what that means is they think so much of themselves, they make the religion about them. About all the great works that they are doing, that they are going to do, or that they have done. And all they brag about is them, 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 me, 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 and all, this, all everything is self-worship. But the Bible tells us that the only way we can have any righteousness, any, any, even an ounce of righteousness is through Christ. Because if I go to my righteousness, the Bible says my most righteous works are filthy rags, which means the very best I can muster up is like dirty rags in God's sight. God is pure. God, God is, is the definition of purity. So if we want to receive righteousness, we have to get that righteousness from Jesus. That means when Jesus takes my sins on the cross, takes my judgment, takes my penalty, he also gives me, imputes unto me, the Bible uses the word, his righteousness. So he receives my sin, I receive his righteousness. And Romans 10, 4 says how we receive it. We receive it by believing. Now that should be an awesome, worship-inspiring thing because God doesn't ask us to sacrifice. He doesn't ask us to, to do some great religious ritual. Listen, Part of what I do in seventh grade history is as I teach world religions. I hear about every religion in the world and teach it. One thing you will see is every other religion besides Christianity is about what you do. You have to do this. You've got to offer this. You've got to go here. You've got to say this this many times. Christianity is not about that. There is a false teaching going around telling people that uh, Christianity is about pleasing, doing things to please God. It's not. We can't do anything to please God. What Christianity is about is about what Jesus Christ did that we may appear acceptable to God. And the way we receive that is simply by faith. That's what that word believeth again means. The word believeth, that E-T-H is actually significant. It means an action word. It's a verb. It's not just a, a noun. It is a verb. In other words, I am actively trusting in this to get into heaven. Now think about this. When... I don't know about you, but when I get to a deadline on something, an assignment, something at work, something is due, I, it makes me just a, a little bit nervous because I know there's a final finality to that. When you encounter death, there is nothing more final than that. And if you've ever been in the presence of someone who is getting ready to die, you can feel the finality of what is about to happen because there's no, you know, there's no coming back from that physically. Now, when you reach that moment personally, you will trust in something to get into heaven. I don't care if you're an atheist. There is something you're going to believe in or trust in to get, try to get into heaven or whatever afterlife you're believing in your faith. Now, anything you trust outside of Jesus Christ is not going to get you into heaven. You can trust all these false gods. You can trust all these good works. And I have heard some doozies of things people trusted. I, I have heard funerals preached where people have said, you know what, Sister so is definitely going to get in because her good outweighed her bad. And I thought, if that's what she's getting in on, then she didn't get in. Because your good will never outweigh your bad. Again, even Paul said, the more he tried to do good, the more he failed at it. And the more he tried to keep from doing bad, the more he failed. Now, Paul wrote most of the Bible, so he should be an example unto us. Yet his example is an example of personal failure. But when we trust in Jesus Christ, Jesus cannot fail because Jesus is divine. Jesus is God in the flesh. So because of that, when I put my faith and trust in him, I can trust that it is concrete and it will not falter. When they set mine and Mandy's trailer up the holler here, I was a little nervous. Because when they place it on those cinder blocks that go underneath the trailer, they did not pour no concrete. Apparently, they don't do that for single wise anymore. It's just a double wide thing. Well, I kept thinking, I don't know a whole lot about engineering, but I know that concrete is more solid than dirt. And I kept thinking, they put this big thousands of pound building on top of these cinder blocks. What's going to happen? 
She's going to sink. It wasn't going to have a firm enough foundation in my mind. Well, Albert, I don't know about you, but when I enter eternity, I want a firm foundation for my faith. I want something that I know I can lean on and trust on. And there is nothing more firm than Jesus Christ. The Bible says he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And when I look at me, I can't say that I'm the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. There's things I change about on a daily basis. Sometimes I like black coffee. Sometimes I like cream. Sometimes I like boiled eggs. Sometimes I like scrambled. Day to day, there's so many things changes about me. But yet, the character of God never changes. And I gave this comparison the other night when I was kind of trying to explain eternal security to an individual. I said, in our faith, it is what signs the contract or covenant with God. Now, here's the beautiful part about this covenant contract that we have with God. It is the fact that God done the work on the contract side, which means if God done the work on the contract and we are receiving based on the contract, there is nothing that we can do to void that contract. God done everything to earn what we are getting. And that is awesome because if I can mess it up, I'm going to mess it up. I, I, I've told people times, I said, listen, if it's breakable, I will break it. If it's destroyable, I'm going to destroy it. I have literally hit something with every vehicle I have ever owned. I've hit a deer with every single vehicle I've ever purchased. That's just the way my luck runs. But I can be thankful because when it comes to eternity, it's not based upon my luck. It's based on the work of Jesus Christ and what God has done. And I can take that to the bank. Just like Abraham, because I have believed and trusted in God, I will receive Jesus' righteousness and nothing can take that away from me. The second thing is through faith, we become children of Abraham. Now, again, I've said this in the last few weeks, but... I don't know of anyone that lives in our community that is Jewish or Gentiles. So we are a little bit different when it comes to our relationship with God. We see in Genesis 15, 5, it says, and, and be brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars that thou be able to number them. And he said to them, so shall thy seed be. And this is God speaking to Abraham. So God has told Abraham that there is going to be, I mean, we look at the sky, the other night was really clear. We don't look at the stars. And it's innumerable. You can't count the amount of stars into heaven. Here is Abraham who is childless. And God said, your offspring is going to be as the stars in the heaven. Now, he is talking about literally the, the nation of Israel. But spiritually, he is speaking of us because we become children of Abraham. Now, Abraham didn't have that in his mind because obviously this is under a different dispensation. But yet, when we fast forward to when we get into the New Testament... We see that the Gentiles are grafted into that tree by our faith in Jesus Christ. We were, our people were pagans. They were worshiping false gods, all kinds of crazy stuff. We didn't deserve for God to reach out to us. But yet, through His grace, He did. Romans eleven sixteen through 17 says, For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, which then with them partakes of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Now, what it is speaking of is those, uh, those Israelites, those Jews, who refused to accept Jesus Christ. Because of that, they had been broken off from the tree. But because the gospel went out to the Gentiles, by us placing our faith in Jesus Christ, we have an opportunity to have a relationship with God that we wouldn't have had without that. You see, if the Jews hadn't rejected the gospel in the beginning and Paul wasn't sent out to preach the gospel unto the Gentiles, we would still be going around worshiping rocks and stones and all kinds of crazy stuff. Notice who'd done the first move, though. It wasn't man. It wasn't the Gentiles saying, I hope and hope and hope he accepts us in to the fold. No. God, by his grace sent Paul out to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, and through that, the gospel went out to the entire world. That it's not just if the nation of Israel believes, but it's as the Bible, the book of John has, that for whosoever believes now will not perish but everlasting life. Every man, woman, and child, regardless of nationality, regardless of race, regardless of creed, has an opportunity to take in the blessings of God because 
of our faith in Jesus Christ. Folks, that's the key that opens the door to all these things. It's all faith. Without faith, we cannot please God. But the Bible says a mustard seed of faith can move mountains. I think a lot of times about the fact that, you know, if, if the church in the world today prayed with faith for more things and grumbled less, complained less, and worried less, Imagine how much different of a world we may live in today. Imagine how many more people may come to faith in Christ that instead of us working and striving and worrying to death, we was obedient and just asked God for these things in faith. And it doesn't, guarantee, it doesn't say every person is going to be saved because obviously there's a free will factor in there that they got to make a decision. But yet... It's amazing how much better God is at doing things than we are, yet sometimes we think it's all about us, when really it should be all about God. Listen, through faith, we receive this relationship that we that I don't know about you, but it changed my life. Um, I've got relations with a lot of people. I have a wonderful wife, kids, family, friends, whatever. And a lot of those did have an effect on me, but nothing changed me the way a relationship with God did. With that relationship, not only did I receive salvation, but I became a new creature. The old things passed away, all things become new. My desire for things and priorities changed somewhat based on my relationship with God. I went from having fruits of the flesh 24-7 to fruits of the Spirit. Um, I can love people now that hate me, and I couldn't do that many years ago. Before I was saved, I would just soon punch them if it was, if it was me. But yet when God comes in, he takes away all that. He begins to work in you and he changes you and molds you. But the only reason we have that is because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Not because of good works, not because of anything else. All because of the blessings come from him. Third thing, we are blessed because we have that connection with God. You know, there's a lot of things, again, we strive for in life. But James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Now realize, if you are saved tonight, again, you are God's child. You are, you are not just a stranger. You are adopted into his family. A part of the Jewish tradition is, if you are adopted in, you have all the same rights as a blood relative. There is no difference. So because of that, you receive everything that a blood-born child would receive. That's why the Bible says we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Because we receive everything Jesus receives because he is the son. Well, I'm also the son of God because I was saved. I was born again. Because of that, God takes care of us. Now, we don't think about this a whole lot because we all, a lot of times just look at God as being, you know, he saves us, he gives us heaven, and that's great. But God takes care of us here, too. God doesn't just save you and then go to heaven and say, well, I'm going to wait for you to die now and then we'll be together. No, God is involved in every aspect of your life. The Bible says God works together all things for the good of those that love God and are called according unto his purpose, which means everything you do, even the bad things that happen to you, God is working in them situations to use them for your good. That's really hard to accept when tragedy comes or, or, or something bad happens. But we have to realize the Word tells us that. And if the Word says it, it's fact. God's going to take this horrible situation and He's going to use it for my good in some way, form, or fashion. No matter how bad it is. And we see in James that every good thing we have, we can only credit it to one source. And that's back to God. Our home, our family, our food, our health, our church everything, our work, it is all a blessing from God. Now, here's what happens a lot of times. God gives us this great blessing, and we being in the flesh and being human, what do we do? We begin to grumble about that blessing. We say, well, you know, I got this car here, but I really wish I had a new car. Why do I got this old, old ugly car for? Well, you know, I got this home, but I wish it was a two-story. I hate that it's a one-story. I wish I had something nicer. And I think about this, and this convicts me because I'm guilty of this. I think of this, and I sometimes I think, you know what? I'm really complaining about God's blessing. I'm really saying, God, what you gave me is not good enough. I think I deserve something better. When in reality is, I don't deserve what I have. I don't deserve anything. I deserve hell and condemnation. I deserve death. 
But God has given me all these things, and the only thing that I should ever omit is praise for them. That's a challenge for you and me both. Because again, we live in a world of constantly wanting more. But yet as Christians, we should constantly live with a voice of praise for what we do have. And I really think that our ancestors done this a little bit better than we do sometimes because they, they didn't have as much and they weren't exposed to, to another lifestyle. So because of that, when the crops came in, they praised God. When the roof didn't leak, they praised God. But it seems like in today's world, we, it's always more and more and more when we should really be praising more and more and more. Philippians 1.11 says, Being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and what praise of God. So not only our physical possessions, but our salvation, our righteousness should draw us to praise God. Again, be careful how you talk about salvation. By saying, yeah, I got saved because I walked to the front of the church. And here's the scary part. I have talked to people and, I, and we'll talk about salvation. And I, I try to do that through questions because you get more out of people that way. And I'll say, well, you know, how do you get saved? Well, I got to walk to the front of the building. Well, I, I got I to gotta be with a pastor. Well, all these falsehoods that are not biblical whatsoever. And all of a sudden you realize, wait a second, maybe we're portraying it the wrong way. Maybe we're telling people about salvation the wrong way. Not intentionally, but it's coming across the wrong way. And I think sometimes it's because of how we talk about our salvation experience. Because the bottom line is, when I got saved, I wasn't looking to get saved. I wasn't looking to, to get right with God. In fact, I mean, I, I, I was, couldn't say anything. But the Holy Spirit beckoned me and that opened my eyes to my need to be right with God. And all I can point back to is the work of God. And through the work of God, it instilled a faith in me by attending church and hearing the preaching of the word. I can remember one night when I was going to, I was living in Huntington, going to Marshall, and I was sitting about three pews back on this side, and Brother Keith McClung was preaching revival here. And I can tell you that I absolutely felt the convicted heart I've ever felt my entire life at the end of that service and being preached to. And I didn't get saved that night, but I raised my hand to be prayed for. And, and that was a, a beginning of a journey to faith because the preached word did bring Holy Spirit conviction upon me. Why? Because the word says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It wasn't through um, any sort of special fancy talk or, you know, it's not like selling a car. When, when you hear the word of God, the Holy Spirit does something supernatural with it to build a faith in you. And that's why, again, we all become sometimes impatient with people thinking, you know, I, I wish they'd get saved now. Why do they wait? But you know what? God's timing is perfect. And sometimes people are, are more hard-hearted like I was. And it takes time for them to, that God chisels off those rough edges and begins working on a person. And eventually he, we, he, we come to faith. He takes away that heart of stone and stalls the heart of flesh like he talks about in the Bible. And we become a new creature. But nobody can rush that process. And it only comes through and by faith. And we have to give God the praise and give God the glory because that's part of that root they talk about in that olive tree. What we are receiving. You know, a tree draws out of its root system into it, brings up water, brings up nutrients and things like that. For us, everything we receive comes from God through that root system. God is the provider. God provides our physical blessings. And as we see in Philippians, God provides our salvation. He provides our righteousness. He provides that, that cleanliness that we can only spiritually get through and by Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 16 through 17 says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. This blessing, again, that we're talking about, we talk about physical blessing, we talk about salvation blessing, but we're also receiving after we leave here physically. A time is going to come in which we will perish. Uh, none of us is, is here forever, as much as we like to think that. And, and, you know, in the short time I've been here, we've seen brothers and sisters go home to be with God. And some of it suddenly, uh, this month, one year since Granny passed away, listen, if you told me back in September that she'd been gone in October, I would say, you're crazy. It ain't going to happen. She's healthy as a horse. You never know what's going to happen. But we are promised in the word as Jesus left the disciples. He said, I must go away to prepare a place. That way, where I am, you may be so also. 
In my Father's house are many mansions. And Jesus went and prepared that, not just so he could say, look at what I have. He prepared it for us, the church. That when the time comes, that our time down here comes to a close, be it through death or through the rapture, we get to enjoy all that. We inherit that. Listen, we're not going to go to heaven just to be some, you know, meek little creature that is, you know, groveling at God. We will worship, but yet the Bible talks about us being royalty. You know, he's got a whole city prepared for us being this new Jerusalem that we're going to dwell in for all eternity with God. With absence of sin, absence of sorrow, absence of heartache. And we only get that through and by Jesus Christ. Not so just we can be servants down here, but that we enjoy the blessings of the Lord in eternity. A lot of times we get so fixated with what God does here that we miss out on what's waiting for us. Because we say, you know what, I got, I got a headache. Why did God not cure my headache? Uh, Sister so-and-so has got this problem. I wonder why God didn't heal that. And we get all wrapped up in what's physical. Listen, the Bible says, if my hope be in this word, I'll be of men most miserable. Because you are never going to escape suffering while you're in the flesh. It's not going to happen. Long as you're alive, long as you're breathing, you're going to have aches. You're going to have pains. You're going to have fog glasses because of masks. You're going to have all kinds of issues. But yet... There is a time going to come for God's church that we know is awaiting us. Now, we don't know necessarily how it's going to come. The Lord may come back and call us out of here before the night's over and we'll be gone. Or death may call us. But either way, God has promised us that there is no doubt about where we are going to go once we leave here. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And the Bible even talks about God welcoming his children in. He says, enter in thy good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you a ruler over many. Man, that's awesome. He doesn't say enter in because you've been faithful. He doesn't mean because you've been perfect. He doesn't say enter in because you've never made a mistake. He doesn't say enter in because you're sinless. He says, you know what? You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you a ruler over many. That shows the grace and the goodness of God. That it, again, he knows our imperfection. He knows all your faults and all your failures. I think about it all the time. Because sometimes I just really enjoy pondering on the graces of God. And I think about, you know what? Since I got saved several years ago now, I, I've, I've commit, done all kinds of stupid things and made all kinds of stupid mistakes. And God knew I was going to do all that. Yet he still saved me. God knew every mistake I was going to make all the way into eternity. And yet he still saved me. Because that is how much love God has. Jesus even speaks of the church as a gift. He says, of those the Father gave me, I lost none. Now, I guarantee a lot of people who knows me would not view me as a present. But Jesus did. That shows how he looks at you and how he looks at I. That we are a gift to have. That he, we are something to be desired. Because he loves us. Why does he love us? Why are we right with him? Well, again, it's not because of our goodness. Because Ephesians 2 says we are saved by grace through faith. We have a covenant relationship with God. If you adopt a child today, you go into the adoption agency, they'll give you a bunch of papers to fill out and sign. Make it official that that child's yours. Well, when God adopted us into his family, there was a contract. There was a covenant. It was offered by grace and it was sealed by faith. Folks, it ain't got a thing to do with works, not a thing to do with the law. But it's all about the grace of God and our faith in Jesus Christ. I pray that the message this evening was a